Hello everyone and welcome back to my colonization series in Kerbal Space Program 0.90 Beta. In this episode I have an entire new lineup of launchers to show you and those are designed with a sort of modular system with stage recovery in mind because I've installed stage recovery as some people have suggested instead of relying on FMRS and that's led to a different sort of configuration for the rockets because to take advantage of how stage recovery works and I should remind you that in 0.90 stage recovery does not have uh, powered descent mode it doesn't understand powered descent so it had to be parachute uh, descent with that but um, the rockets are not fully recoverable I do intend to go back to fully recoverable systems but uh, for now I think this will do and the other drawback is that now with 1.0, if I try to make a fully recoverable system and do all the testing that's required to try and bring it close to the KSC, something I haven't done in a while, you'll note that my, my stages arrive all over the place. Uh, the reason is because I haven't been willing to sit down and do all the testing necessary to uh, get back to the KSC exactly because I know the aerodynamics are all different in the newer version of KSP and I'd rather focus on getting stuff done in that version. So that's, that's sort of the hang up there. But uh, I've got a good launcher system and I think you'll like it. But uh, first I need to get some business done. And with the new launcher we'll launch uh, certain modules to Drez. I think we'll only handle one this time because uh, it's a big one. So we'll see about that. And I've got a lot to explain as far as the launchers are concerned. But uh, first a tr crew transfer to Minmus, right? Uh, we needed more crew around Minmus and less crew around the moon. I don't think we need to go for the surface base though. I don't know what I was thinking, but it looks like the surface base is pretty well off. Uh, if you take a look at the Kerbitat here, that's got 320 days of supplies for five crew. That's excellent. I don't even know how it got that much. And then uh, we can see that there is a, there should be a gold bug somewhere. Where's the gold bug? Gold bug. Ah, oh, there's the gold bug. 248 days for the one per, uh, one uh, Kerbal in the gold bug. So that's not bad. Um, so really the places that we need to take crew out of is Mooner Station 1. And probably uh, we will lead, we will abandon the, the mining station around the moon. So the Carbonite Mining Station, we've got two crew there. Maybe, maybe we'll just take one out. So we'll take one out from there. Okay. So... Yeah, I think that's the plan. And so this is the vehicle we're going to use. This is the uh, rescue vehicle. And let's top her up and probably get uh, Pepe Kerman out. We'll leave Rich Moore in command of the moon station. Up, oh, it says Pepe Kerman is unable to reach the Tal command pod. And it looks like Rich Moore is already in there. So I could cross EVA them. But I guess I'll leave Pepe in command of the moon station after all and save myself that EVA. Uh, okay, so we're going to undock the tile command pod here and proceed open hatch. Oh, well, that, that's because, okay. Hmm. Okay, anyway, undock. Uh, rescue pod. Oh. Richmore, you don't have... Oh, uh, no, you just have very little. I think that might be enough for this trip. Let's see. Three days. Yeah, uh, well... Let, let's get a little bit more in this. Hold on, let's back up and then redock. Should have thought of that. Okay, so just a little bit more in terms of supplies would be nice. Not from there, not from there. Well, this supply ship is pretty much done for. Yeah, we should undock this and get a new one. So, add that to the list of launches we have to do. Okay, once again, seem to be running out of everything, but this time we have five days. I'll take that. So, let's close the hatch. We've got 3,000 Delta V, which is quite a lot and we'll need a little bit of it to get to our carbonite mining station because that's at a radically different inclination uh, at least it's not going backwards or anything but uh, you can see probably around here we want to 
do our inclination change. We're here now. Let's see. Yep. Okay. I think that's our surface complex over there. Okay, uh, let's go. After Corporal Joint Reinforcement. Okay, there goes our station. You know, I really want to pepper the moon with bases. We should have bases all over the place. We really need to do that. We need more funds, though. We are a long way off from having the kind of funds we need to sustain all sorts of bases on the moon. Okay, so it's looking like we could get an approximate intercept over at our descending node, maybe. Looks like it was a little bit off. Oh no, it's it's getting there. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, 2.2 off there. We could probably correct that a little bit more. But this should be fine. So uh, we'll head over to the carbonite mining station and pick up that Kerbal. Okay, we are now in render range of the carbonite mining station. We are, have a closest approach distance of under 400 meters thanks to a 3 meter per second burn on the opposite side of the planet, our moon. Open shield, open hatch. I'm I'm confused. Open hatch? Huh. Maybe that's a Kerbal transfer thing. I don't know. Whatever. Anyway. Maybe it's uh, something to do with the way I upgraded the series that I have both open shield and open hatch, maybe. Okay. Anyway, let's hop on over to the station. And yeah, Bob. Oh, uh, two of them. Bob and Bill are both here. So we'll probably transfer Bob because he's a scientist and all. I swear the station is tumbling. Might be because of its rotating mo. Uh, I don't know. Seems like it's tumbling. It's been hard to approach it. Of course, this whole thing. Yeah, it's definitely tumbling. Hold on, let me time warp a bit. Okay, well that counts as up tumbling, but I need to slow down. Okay, there we go. All right, so uh, Bob gets to. We just transfer like this, right, Bob? No, nope, says he can't reach the Tau Command Pod either, like uh, like Pepe had a problem with. So uh, let's EVA Bob and do it that way. The the whole thing is still tumbling. I think it's because of this rotational section causing some momentum. Hold on Bob. Uh, okay, well it looks like we're gonna have to do things the hard way with this thing rotating. This is weird though, I, I don't remember this being a thing. So yeah, every time I load up the scene, the station starts tumbling. And I think it's because of the rotation of that thing, but I'm not sure. Which would make sense, you know, conservation of angular momentum. It's going in one way. The rest of the station has to try and go the other way, but... Uh-oh. Up, up. I think he bumped. Yeah. Okay, board. Alright, well now we've got two Kerbals in the command pod. Okay, very interesting. I had to leave Kerbal alone for a bit as the stuff transferred and you can see that the station has developed a bit of a rotation. And so, yeah, that is a problem. We're going to have to, in future space, space station designs, we're going to have to have two counter-rotating -rotation, habitation rings. So that's going to have to be a thing in order to stabilize it. I, I guess we'll just have to mount them in opposite directions in the VAB since I don't see an option to invert the rotation here. Okay, but for now I'm just going to use time warp to stabilize and undock this command pod. Okay, so backing away. I mean presumably the reason that I have this rotation is actually because 
the station doesn't have SAS on, but that it doesn't have any operational SAS modules? Oh, there's no pilots on board. Ah, that's a problem. Okay, uh, and there wasn't any pilot on board. Uh, when I originally built this station, Bill and Bob were both qualified to command stuff. Uh, they, they, were, they were essentially pilots. But since the upgrade to point nine zero, neither of them is a pilot. Uh, so we, we're going to need to send a new pilot up here in order to control this thing. So that's the problem. Anyway, Carbonite Mining Station now with one crew and tumbling a little bit is, uh, has 290, uh, 238 days worth of food, water, and oxygen. Mooner Station 1 has only 150 days, but our focus is now on this, which only has 5 days. So we need to transfer to Minmus within 5 days and dock up with the two the two bullwinkles alright so let me plot for that and then I'll show you what I've got okay so what we've got here is a very strange transfer from here and of course this is not a Holman transfer by any stretch of the imagination and that's because if I had to wait for a Holman transfer I'd have to wait for the moon to go along in its orbit for a bit uh, in order to get to the right phase angle and that would take a while and probably outstrip the resources that we have on board the tau command pod in order to feed our Kerbals. So we have to go a little bit fast, well a lot faster and that means when we get to Minmus we're going to have to burn a lot to slow down. And so yeah, um, why do we have not much, f oh this is the wrong thing. Huh, okay, so I was, uh, I plotted all that for the wrong thing. Darn. Okay, let's not transfer the Carbonite Mining Station. Let's transfer this. So, let me plot that again, and then I'll come back to you. Okay, so I've uh, replotted everything, because just copying the numbers wouldn't work. So, uh, yeah, had to make adjustments for this orbit now, and we've got another Mimis encounter, close to what I expected. It's in 2 days and 14 hours, with a periapsis at 17 hours, so that should be fine for our food, water, and oxygen consumption. Uh, you'll note that uh, it actually is another um, cycler orbit. In other words, it uh, hits the moon again here. So that's interesting. But uh, yeah, anyway, it's quite a burn. Let's get to it. Okay, I did the burn, but it isn't quite hitting the way I wanted it to. Typical. So let me correct. Okay, so 600 kilometers or so on the periapsis. Let's get to it and see what we have to correct. Now we have to, of course, meet up with the Bullwinkles, which are in fairly inclined orbits around Minmus, and we could be coming in backwards here. Uh, I keep saying running out, but that's because we have very large tanks, and it's programmed to warn us at 10%. And so, yeah, we're, we're fine. Too much stuff. Okay, uh, let's go for Bowinkle B Moose first, since it was the first one I was able to click on. Okay, well, 0, 0.0. And looks like our intersect is up to 3.3 kilometers. We'll adjust that as we go in. Okay, well, closest approach distance does not look like what I intended. So, correction burn will be necessary. Probably out here will be best. Okay, here's the correction. Okay, and that's the closest approach distance I wanted. Alright, so let's meet up with Bowinkle B. Come on, where are you, target marker? There we are. Alright, shouldn't be too bad. We can turn around the Bowinkle. I wasn't turning around the well, I was involuntarily turning around this station, of course. Uh, we didn't even have a pilot on board the, the Carbonite Mining Station. But we do have a pilot on board the Bullwinkle B, and we could turn it around because it's a proper ship. So this should be an easy maneuver. Which is good because I've got uh, another one to do right after this. And we, do, we want to expedite. Expedite is the name of the game here. Okay, this time we should be on a fly straight in, which is a lot easier than trying to deal with the Carbonite Mining Station, which I didn't realize would be tumbling like that. Okay, a little Kerbin in the background there. And Docking Port Magnetism should be able to handle this. 
this this docking port is a little bit clippy in there it's actually I don't think I was able to really correct that anyway I say us off on this part there we go all right now with the hatch open maybe we can do a crew transfer properly let's see unable to reach the fuel refinery huh guess we might have to EVA Bob unless see ship manifest now as I mentioned what, what I was doing wrong with the transfer thing let's see if this can deal with that so fuel refinery transfer no uh, they said that I had clicked this and that was moved to another seat but it looks like uh, even using this to transfer has the same problem it it just it just doesn't transfer them. So uh, uh, maybe it was because there's some other issue with transferring them. Even though this docked directly to the fuel refinery note, uh, it's not like there should be any obstruction between this and well. I mean, I guess the life support container. I don't know. But uh, yep, yeah, I guess I can't do it that way. That's fine. Um, action in progress. Nope, I can close it like that. Let's see, let's get uh, Bob out on EVA and transfer Bob like this. Uh oh, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. Uh, he just passed right through that. That's not right, that's not right. Bob's a ghost. the heck we've transferred cribbles like this before grab no uh oh come on Bob tell me you can bump into something okay yeah you can bump into something it's just a fuel refinery the fuel refinery is glitchy I think I should lo reload the program maybe let's get Bob back to the tile command pod and then I'll reload the program. Well you can board something. Hmm. So we can't transfer them any other way and we can't EVA them to this thing. This is a really uh really troublesome system we've got here. But anyway, let me see if it's just a RAM issue and for some reason it's not loading something properly. We have been doing a few things this time. We loaded two stations during this and I haven't restarted since. So, alright, let's uh, leave it here and I'll come back to it. Okay, back after restart and let's try this EVA again. If it doesn't work, we're going to be in some trouble. Because we don't seem to be able to transfer Kerbals any other way. Okay, we've grabbed and we board. Okay, so that strange thing, probably somehow RAM related, I don't know, but uh, solved by a restart. So we've delivered Bob to this location. We're missing inputs, so we can't really read what the new efficiency would be if, uh, if we were churning out our products. Bullwinkle A is there. Should be able to. Uh, it's going to be a while before the Bullwinkle A can catch up to us. Okay, so it's going to be a whole orbit that we have to wait. So it looks like to transfer from the Bullwinkle B to the Bullwinkle A takes about 6 meters per second. Not much. So that's good. Very positive for our future operations. And probably we can expect a correction of about 6 meters per second on the other end once we meet up with it. So I guess this has already processed everything it can from this thing. Yeah, it's already processed the ore and sub I don't think it carried substrate up. Still a little bit of substrate in the whole equation. Maybe there's something for our new arrival to help out with.
No, I think uh, we needed uh, another input in order to process the substrate, though. We still seem a little bit off in some angles. It looks pretty good, but closest approach distance is pretty far. I don't see why we would be 8 meters off. I'm just not seeing where that 8 meters is. So that's a little bit worrying. I mean, we're already below the closest approach distance that's listed there. So I don't get it. I don't get how it gets that closest approach distance at all. Well, let's take SAS off as people always recommend. It should be fine with the magnetism. There we go. And a little bit of coaxing. We have a dock. All right. So now, Richmore, let's not uh, uh, use the crew transfer or anything like that. Let's just straight up EVA him on the assumption that that's necessary. And board. All right. So Richmore is in. And here we have 416 days worth of food, water, and oxygen. Lunar Station 1 has 148 days. So Moonner Station 1 is probably our worst off situation. Everything else seems to be quite nice. The Winkle V Moose has a huge amount as well. Okay, so let me get that that uh, food, water, and oxygen transfer vehicle, the life support transfer vehicle, off of Moonner Station 1 since it's empty. I think we can return that back to Kerbin. Okay, here we go. Pepe Kerman must be a pilot then, because he's got this thing stable. But in any case, uh, this is, let me just verify that it's completely empty. Yep, all four tanks. Now, let me verify that as fuel. It does have a little bit of fuel. I think it, uh, let me undock it and see, but I think it should be enough to get it back. Oh, uh, well, Pepe Kerman might not be in control. It might be actually the controller on this. Well, let's uh, let's undock and find out. Nope, there still seems to be control over here. This has electric charge, mon propellant, and liquid fuel and oxidizer. It has 355, so, I mean, it doesn't have parachutes, so we weren't going to uh, actually recover this. But we can bring it down and uh, dispose of it in Kerbin's atmosphere. So that is what I'm planning to do here. Well, let's have it go uh, in proper style, retrograde. We'll leave the solar panels out though for extra effects. So uh, our equivalent of, not a dragon capsule because those actually get recovered, but uh, an ATV, uh, uh, progress, uh, something like that, except that this made it all the way out to the moon. And lost some solar panels, uh, docking maneuver failure, I believe. Okay, stuff has blown up, but we still got solar panels, both solar panels sticking out there. wonder what could have burned up before the solar panel. An RCS thruster block and uh, Illuminator Mark 1. Uh, I think we finally lost that solar panel on the bottom there. Still got one solar panel sticking out the side here. Uh, it looks like the other re-entry has allowed this to remain safe and the solar panel is still there. Amazing. Don't worry, I mean, this, I guess this will be uh, ocean debris. Oh, there go the solar panels due to aerodynamic forces. Okay, that should be complete obliteration, hopefully, so we don't have to pick anything up. Alright, back to Space Center. Okay, so here we go. It is now time to talk about the new line of launchers from the EDB, the newest line of launchers. And this is the Strider line, named because of the way that the mainsails are placed on the bottom of the center stage here, sort of 
like they're riding horseback or something. But uh, yeah, so this is the Strider line and this is the basic model. This is the 100 tons to low curve and orbit model. And we've just got a 100 ton tank at the top here, exactly 100 tons. And so that's not including the fairing or the fairing base. So that is the payload for this launcher. It could probably take 120 tons. Uh, we'll bring out the Delta V stats here. Uh, you can see 3,902 with a 100 ton payload. It delivers uh, close to 20% of its uh, mass to orbit, which is excellent. Uh, the upper diameter of the payload fairing is 5 meters, so it might need to widen up in order to accommodate larger payloads. And we'll see that with the Dres payload, in fact. But uh, anyway, the idea is that the core of this is disposable. So the, we'll lose the two mainsails, which is not too bad when you think about the mainsails are... Now the tanks cost quite a lot too. The mainsails cost uh, 5650 So it's not too bad, uh, especially compared to the cost of this stuff in 1.0, right? Uh, in 1.0 the mainsails are more expensive, I believe. The tanks are very expensive. Uh, you can see the dry ma uh, the dry cost of the tank is thirty thousand here and twenty three thousand here. The idea of the Strider line is to have a cost, the disposed cost, be less than a thousand funds per ton delivered to orbit, and this fulfills that because these SRBs on the side. And yes, I am using SRBs, the much hated SRBs, the ones that I always try to avoid, make sense now because of stage recovery. Now that I'm using stage recovery, these can come back down safely without me having much hassle. And these four are recoverable, and they each cost 14500 and we recover, well, that's not including the parachutes, and uh, we've got uh, a drag chute, drogue chute on the top here, and of course separation boosters as well. But uh, yeah, largely recoverable except for the internal fuel. And the thrust of this is uh, less than the mainsail, 1,130 kilonewtons, and the burn time is 92 seconds, 100 seconds in vacuum. You see the full 100 seconds here. But uh, yeah, so this is the basic model, and these I expect to be recoverable. Now you note the parachutes are on top, which means that if I was actually following them down, when they tip over, they would probably get destroyed. Uh, their touchdown speed should be very low considering the, um, the dry mass of this is 10 tons and these are large real shoots uh, designed more for about 3 tons a piece. So they can bring it down to less than 6 meters per second is my expectation. Uh, but the thing is the real space shuttle saw rocket boosters had their parachutes on top and the reason why that worked out, why it didn't explode on tipping over, was because the parachutes remained there while it tipped and slowed that tip down so that it could land safely in the water. Uh, so that is something that is sort of missing in this version of KSB but in 1.0 they have they have greater persistence with the parachutes. They stay for a lot longer allowing that sort of thing to be safe. Uh, you know the the boosters slowly tip into the water. But in any case, if, if it was a real issue, I could obviously move the parachutes lower. I mean, uh, have a separate pair of parachutes down here and a pair up there. It wouldn't be a problem. So let's just leave it configured like this for now, since it'll work with stage recovery. And uh, we can debate the particularities of it later. But uh, yeah, my hope is that this will work with stage recovery properly, and we'll have to see that. We'll have to test it. Uh, it's a fairly simple thing, so that is the goal. And again, this center stack is disposable and stage recovery will handle these, so I don't have to spend, spend extra time bringing stages back, and that's the idea. Now, this is a modular system in that these boosters could be used in different configurations. You might think, well, we could double this up, right? Well, yes, and let's take a look at that. All right, here is the Strider X and its capacity is 240 tons here and that's expected capacity obviously I have to actually launch it to find out but uh, the delta V works fine the upper diameter is 6 meters and we have 8 of those same boosters exactly identical boosters and uh, the core now has 4 mainsails at the bottom 
So uh, four mainsails and eight boosters. And we recovered the boosters. The loss on this vehicle is 200,000, which is less than 100, uh, I mean, uh, less than 1,000 funds per ton delivered to orbit. And the loss for the Strider will be 100,000 then, or less than 100,000. So that's the idea. And so this is our largest launcher. 240 tons means that, again, it delivers close to 20% of its mass to orbit, which is, again, I think very good. Now, bigger isn't necessarily better. We will have small payloads to deliver, uh, such as supplies. And so we can't be using the Strider and the Strider X all the time. So what about downsizing the whole thing? So here we are, now two boosters and a single mainsail making up the Strider Light. And uh, of course you might have seen this coming. And of course the payload is 50 tons, half of the Strider. And it works out just fine. Uh, this is the whole scalability of the system. Uh, the, the reason why I favored it is because it uh, has this property of being so delightfully scalable. And it works out fine. And of course, as long as the boosters are recoverable, then the boosters are recoverable on all of these. And in fact, uh, if you can imagine reusing them, then they'll be able to reuse them on each of these launchers. So uh, after a Strider launch, we could use those boosters on two Strider Lite launches, or uh, half of them, uh, half of the boosters on a Strider X. Now there is one other configuration that we can have: 50 tons to low curve in orbit is still quite a lot. What if we have a smaller payload? Well, there is one option for that. This is the Strider Superleggera, or Superlight. And it carries 18 tons, not quite 25 tons, which you might have expected, but 18 tons. Unfortunately, going this small doesn't quite work out the same way. We can't use a mainsail at the center anymore. What we really have is actually, oops, uh, let me get the fairings off. What we have is actually a skipper here, and that changes things a bit. Uh, so 18 tons to low carbon orbit, and so the skipper fires after a single uh, SRB is launched. Now the SRB uh, does not have much gimbal on its own, so uh, I don't, well, I, I don't think these have any gimbling actually. Uh, let's see, procedural SRB, oh it has 0.25 degrees, so I thought that considering we don't have a controller on this, uh, all we have on this whole thing is this probodovidin hex. We don't have any reaction wheel. So, yeah, uh, that's why we have these little vernier thrusters. Vernier thrusters. They're actually vernier thrusters. That's how vernier thrusters work. Uh, Rockmax 2477s. Uh, they don't work as well in this role as they do in 1.0. In 1.0, they have a huge gimbal range. Here, they only have one degree, but that's probably going to be enough. We'll have to test it out. And up here, uh, this is no longer, on the regular boosters, this is just a uh, structural part. Uh, here, it is an actual fuel tank with uh, tons of fuel. And the amount of fuel that the, these thrusters have, I'll show you, is exactly the same as the duration of the booster. So 1 minute and 40 seconds. So as long as the booster fires, fires the vernier thrusters fire, and so it will maintain stability. Now, uh, we had to add... Uh, these radial shoots, uh, I mean, uh, we had these shoots, but we didn't, we had the nose cone shoot, we have th those in the form of a drag shoot now. And so the configuration is a little bit different. Part of the loss of the payload to orbit, the fact that there's 18 tons instead of 25, is the fact that we're carrying fuel for the vernier thrusters, that's also a thing. So yes, uh, but this is the Superleggera version of the Strider, come on little fairing. Not that I have to pack it up right now, we, we aren't using it. But this is the, the last of the variants. So, four variants of the Strider. Same basic idea. This is meant to be recoverable again. We'll have to see whether it is. But the first variant that I want to test is the Strider itself. The basic, the base model with 100 ton to orbit capacity. And we are going to be launching that capacity on the mission to Drez. So let's take a look at that. I have called the payload the Drez Oasis. And uh, we have a very large payload here. You can see uh, quite substantial, actually a little bit more than 100 tons. But like I said, the Strider could probably carry 120. I was being conservative. But the Dreads Oasis is a fabulously complicated vehicle. And the core of this is a fuel refinery. Okay, so root part, core, whatever you like, loaded with machinery here, as you can see. 
and uh, so it's all ready to go to do its fuel refinery thing and of course in order to do that he needs water and it's carrying a lot of water with it already we've got tons and tons of water uh, 4,800 days for four Kerbals if you'd like to measure it like that uh, we have an oxygen supply of 355 days and the reason that's less than the food is because we are also carrying converters up here we've got a water splitter a carbon extractor and a water purifier so we've got all of that going for us and so uh, really the the time that this can operate without being resupplied is probably the 731 days now looking at those modules you might think those look pretty small but they're not they're very very heavy and that's contributing a lot to the mass of this uh, I think those are the converters there uh, no so yeah okay there we go there they are alright so carbon extractor five tons so you see uh, we, we have a carbon extractor there that's a five ton mass up there okay we, we're not going for large we just got the normal carbon extractor we've got the water purifier that's three tons and water splitter which is 3.4 so right at the top there that's a huge mass and that's a little bit worrying that's why I have a lot of struts going to it hoping that it's not going to sway the whole thing okay we've got two large docking ports this is meant to be a proper station there's a docking port at the base here as well it's got two nukes uh, in order to propel it so it'll propel itself to Drez it's going to take quite a long burn and so that's the downside but on the upside I don't have to waste the time to bring the launcher back and do that whole landing process so I'm more apt to do longer burns like this so uh, you can expect to see much more use of these sorts of vehicles now that I have the time but uh, yeah uh, one realization uh, was that I don't have to use this stupid honey badger command pod it's heavy and it's completely useless uh, I say that because when you look at it these refinery modules like this one uh, the mobile refinery for instance it's got a command module in it it is a command module it actually should be a pod but um, it is an unmanned command module it, so this doesn't need to have and this is actually the fuel refinery it also has a command module in it and it will have Kerbals in in order to do the uh, fuel refinery process we'll send them over but it doesn't need any this can command on its own so that's an important point and so I probably won't be using the honey magic command pod very much anymore unless I mean I, I can't see why I would we'll be launching more like station modules like this instead of uh, ships maybe I'll, I'll think about using the Woolwinkles still but I'll have to think about it because it's not very efficient to launch this four tons every time it's not the best way to go uh, this you, you see uh, modular octo girder liquid fuel thing it's partially filled to keep us under the mass limit and so we've got 45 minutes worth of fuel thanks to that uh, the tank above is empty uh, once we start send, once we send over a drilling unit to Drez that will be filled these rotate out using hinges here and those will be the solar trusses and that's how this Drez station will work so this is a Drez station proper uh, I should slap some docking ports on the sides here though I don't know it wasn't working great on the thing we already have we've got a clampatron up there too I guess uh, better put the docking ports rather than not okay there we go we've got docking ports over there and let's see how it launches yeah yep okay let's see how it launches could be problems could be all right we're about to find out whether this design is worthy or not question is uh oh I think uh, I've sized the fairing without the docking ports and they're sort of poking out there okay now they look better alright bigger fairing just what we need let's try and drop that well dropping it off early we'll have to watch out for that alright let's try this who should we send over obviously scientists are necessary let's just and I don't know one well we really don't need a pilot if there's an unmanned command module there so Philly and Sherlock and we have enough stuff for a lot more I guess we can uh, Rodland does not seem to, uh, lots of courage on that scientist ah here Pat Free seems like a good scientist 
Some of these guys, I swear. We need to get that training complex up too. I think I'll just send three Kerbals over there. Uh, let's let's have at least one pilot. Roller. Roller Kerman and three scientists in the fuel refinery. Okay. Alright, launch clamps look okay, so this shouldn't collapse on the, on the pad. Oh boy. Alright, let's take her out. Looks like a nighttime launch, and I think I might go with it. We've got a lot of lighting on this, as you can see. So, maybe it'll be alright. Where did Kerbal Alarm Clock go? Oh, there it is. Uh, so we actually have six days until the Drez uh, phase angle, and we'll launch now anyway, and we'll have this uh, stay in orbit while I build the other stuff I want to send to Drez. Uh, it's sort of odd sending stuff to Drez, because it's not a very useful place to be, but we are colonizing things, and so I do want to send stuff over, especially a drilling unit for that water, and we'll have to see about that. Uh, I did put a, a detect detector on this, so we can use this to detect the water, so that's going to be important. But anyway, SAS on throttle up, and we'll try this nighttime launch, and they'll be hanging out in orbit while we get the rest of our stuff ready. Okay, so, uh, wow, this is going to be full of trepidation here. Alright, here we go. Alright, we have a launch. And we are clear of the clamps. Excellent. One other thing is I have to make sure that stage recovery does recover the boosters. And that the boosters are read as recoverable. And the thing is, with stage recovery, of course I could add a controller here and just uh, add enough parachutes and stage recovery might be able to deal with it. But I think daily re-entry will probably kill it first. Uh, or it should. Uh, I don't I, I don't want to cheat deadly re-entry or fair mirror space. Using these boosters like this, I'm not cheating either one. Uh, these boosters will survive uh, through uh, descent. We're not going very fast. They're not going to heat up very much. They should be able to survive fair mirror space and deadly re-entry after they finish burning. Well, uh, pretty steady so far, I have to say, considering the very, very large and awkward payload. Now, I tried to make the the sep separatrons separate it properly, we'll have to see, but there, there is an asymmetry in the separatrons. Whenever you try and place something on the procedural tanks, it tends to have some sort of asymmetry on it. Uh, and of course, uh, this is a procedural SRB, so there is an asymmetry with it, and I don't think the things will separate exactly the way I want them to. So that's that's a downer, but uh, that's my expectation. We'll see. Maybe it'll be better than I think it is. But I was very frustrated with them, trying to get them lined up properly. You can sort of see that this one is lower than that one, and it just wouldn't snap to the right place. Okay, your separation coming up. Set. Oh, that's not bad. Uh, don't hit each other though, otherwise you won't be recoverable. Um, a little bit off, a little bit off. But not bad. Uh, I was worried I'd be a lot more off than that, considering how the, those things were uneven. Okay, well we'll have to wait and, and see about the stage recovery. Now, these are huge, but uh, and we need to dump them soon. But they shouldn't collide with this, let's see. Okay, clean. They're off. All right, excellent. Because, yeah, we needed those off to have the Delta V for orbit. Especially with a uh, heavier than 100 ton payload like this. Oh, well, this is going quite nicely. Now, I expected it to be nice, because otherwise I wouldn't have put Kerbals on. Um, and the reason I expected it to be fairly good is, A, I put struts all over the place. You see, there's struts running here, here, here. There's struts all over the place. But also because it's such a, such a simple launcher. These are some brave Kerbals to be, uh, to be going on board of this. At least it looks solid, I mean, you know. 
It gave me confidence somehow. I think uh, we'll bring the periapsis to just short of orbit so that this thing can uh, can be disposed of properly. Uh, we'll have the apoapsis at uh, 120. This thing does not have a controller on it or any frills at all, really. So once we decouple, we won't be able to uh, we won't be able to control it. So we have to have the periapsis low. It doesn't even have verners, so uh, we'll have to use a little bit of thrust in order to turn once we get to apoapsis. Probably should have started this earlier since I'm going to be using the payloads, tiny little nuclear engines to do the rest. Okay, uh, that should be a good descent orbit. Let's separate and immediately start running these. So here we are. This is the ship slash station. It's got uh, 3,800 meters per second right now. That should be enough to do the transfer and and get to orbit around Drez. That's all it needs to do. If necessary, it can convert the water to liquid fuel and oxidizer. Remember that. So it's got a lot more delta V available to it. Okay, I think we can keep it there while we haven't plotted for our transfer yet. So, Infernal Robotics. Okay, so I want the solar hinge. Yeah, come on. Okay, that looks right. All right, uh, solar panels out. Hopefully all action grouped. Yep, they look all good. And then we can rotate them as well if we need to. We could rotate them in line with the station, or otherwise, probably more preferable to have them like this. And oh yeah, I forgot to mention, I did unlock the technology to get the large solar panels. We hadn't unlock unlocked that yet, uh, so I did have to unlock that. Uh, it cost, uh, I think it was 160 science, and I unlocked this, uh, so yeah. Very good. I could have had the fuel tanks practically empty and just used the water to refuel them, but I wasn't too sure about the conversion rate between water and fuel, so I wanted to be cautious about that. But there it is. That is going to be the the largest segment of our Dres mission, I believe. So unless I come up with something in the interim. And so I hope you like that. Okay, hold on a sec. I did my closing spiel and the game crashed when I actually tried to go back to Space Center, so I had to hop back in to make sure that everything was all right. And everything was not all right because uh, listed were only 51 flights instead of the expected 52 or 53. And here we see that we don't have the Drez Oasis. But the Drez Oasis is there if we click Debris. Uh, you can see it. Uh, we have the expected Debris, which is the launch stage. But we also have the Drez Oasis itself listed as debris. So we need to take a look at that situation. Also, I forgot to uh, check up on the recovery of the boosters, so we need to do that. But let's check up on this Drez Oasis first. Well, it seems like everything is intact, but can we... We can control from here. We can rename vessel. Okay, well, we're going to call it a station. I don't know why uh, this fuel refinery is automatically set to debris or something, uh, but uh, yeah, station, very important. And also important, let's check up on the stage recovery, and indeed, uh, it looks like we got uh, 14,500 funds, uh, and that is pretty much as expected. Uh, we didn't get any for the fuel, it says totally refund total refunded for the fuel is zero. And terminal velocity was 4.3, so that's what it splashed down at. And that's less than the 12 that's needed, and less than the 6 that will give us 100% uh, of the recovery value. Uh, it took into account the distance from the KSC, uh, so we only got 97.2% due to distance, but we got 100% thanks to our low speed. And that should be the same for all of, well, it looks like there's some minor difference where they splash down 
that determined how many how much funds we got but we got back about 14,000 from each of the four so that is good and so that means that everything worked out as expected so now everything is all right so with that I'll say thank you for watching if you enjoyed this video please do press like if you have any comments or suggestions please leave them in the comment section below and I'll see you next time